Okay, so now that we've had some practice drawing Lewis dot structures and we've made the connection between valence electrons and lone pairs and bonding pairs and how they affect the molecular geometry, it's time to look at something new and something new that affects the way that molecules behave. And specifically what we're going to talk about now is molecular polarity. So whether or not a molecule is polar or not, and also uh, bond polarity, whether or not a bond within a molecule is polar or not. And fundamentally, both of these pieces deals with electronegativity. And you can see on this table that I have here, Powling electronegativity values. And they're shown in a unique way. There's color coding going from purple when there's a very low value, all the way up to red when there's a very, very high value. The general trend is as we approach fluorine uh, from the left to the right, the electronegativity increases. Another way to look at this is to um, just kind of make a three-dimensional type of landscape picture. And here you can see that a lot of those elements like the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals that are very, very, very reactive are reactive not because of electronegativity, but are reactive because they have a very low ionization energy. Fluorine and all the halogens tend to be very reactive as well, but they're reactive for a completely different reason. And they're reactive because they tend to have a strong, strong attraction to other atoms, electrons. And that's what we essentially characterize electronegativity as. When you have a bond formed between two atoms, electronegativity is the pull of that atom on the other atoms, electrons. Okay, so to get us started with talking about molecular polarity and bond polarity, let's start with bond polarity. So I've opened up the molecule polarity model from FET. It's the same model I'm going to have you investigate later on when you address the discussion prompts. And by default, it'll open up into the two atoms tab. And by default, it'll also show one atom having a different electronegativity value than the other. Now recall from the brief introduction that I just made that you have to have a difference in electronegativity in order to have a difference in pull on another atom's electrons. Fundamentally, again, electronegativity is the pull of one atom, say atom B, on atom A's electrons. So electronegativity is something where you have to have a bond present and even to measure. And that also means that if we have something like right now, the situation where atoms A, atom A's electronegativity is the same as atom B's, that bond has no polarity whatsoever. And we can see that when we click on partial charges, there's no partial charge whatsoever. And the bond character you see right here is purely covalent. And what you're going to notice as you start to play with this model is that you'll get this bond to shift between more covalent in its character and more ionic. The key thing to remember here is covalent means equal sharing. Ionic means unequal sharing. In fact, a purely ionic bond involves transfers of electrons. So whenever you get further away from the covalent side, when you're in the range in the middle, that's where we characterize a bond as being polar covalent. So let's take a look at what that means just briefly. Let's say that atom A happens to be less electronegative than atom B. When I slide that slider over and just make it less, and of course we would know this by looking up their numerical values from the periodic table um, or some other reference that had the Powling electronegativity values, you notice that when I slide it over, the bond character falls in between covalent and ionic. And that just means that it shares electrons, it has some covalent character, but it also shares those electrons unequally. And that inequality res results in a dipole. And a dipole is shown using this symbol here, this arrow, and it always the arrowhead always points toward the more negative side. You'll also notice the convention of using a delta positive and delta negative to indicate that one side is more positively charged and more negatively charged. Another way to visualize this is through looking at something called electrostatic potential. And if you look at this, we see that part of the molecule, or yes, part of the molecule is more negative, and another part is more positive. And that's just due to a difference in electron density. In this case, atom B has a greater affinity towards pulling atom A's electrons towards its nucleus. Okay. And we can see this again when we start to look at electron density. 
you'll notice it's darker in this region around B than A. And we can really exaggerate this effect if we make atom B have even more of an electronegative value. You see it becomes very dark over here. In fact, it becomes so much so that we're almost bordering on an ionic bond where atom A really has no access to those valence electrons that are being shared in that bond. So, a couple of things just to review. Difference in electronegativity values make a bond polar or ionic or covalent. The greater the difference in electronegativity values, the more ionic the bond is. For our circumstances, when we talk about molecules, we're not going to be dealing with ionic bonds, but rather we're going to be dealing with characterizing a bond as either a polar covalent bond or a covalent bond. And just remember, it's really a sliding scale. There's no easy way to say that, hey, this bond is purely covalent unless you're dealing with two atoms of the exact same element bound together, say in the diatomic elements like fluorine gas or hydrogen gas. In those cases, that is a pure covalent bond. Every other bond is going to have a slightly different effect and therefore have a slight amount of polar character to it. Okay? So if we take this a step further and say, well, instead of two atoms, look at three. Uh, but before we even do that, we can start to say, okay, based upon the settings that I have right now, atom A, less electronegative, atom B, kind of in the middle here, we have a molecule overall that's linear in shape and is polar. So not only is the bond polar, but the molecule itself is polar. And we know that because we see these partial negative and partial positive regions labeled, and we see an overall bond dipole here denoted with that black arrow. We can make a situation where that may or may not be the case depending on the geometry of the molecule. So we really have to look at geometry to determine in every circumstance if a molecule is going to be polar or nonpolar. And in order for a molecule to be polar, all that means is it has to have a net bond dipole. It has to have a net dipole moment. And let me show you what I mean by that. So I've changed it right now to three atoms. And just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to make all the sliders the same. So essentially, if we had um, ozone, three atoms exactly the same, bound together, oxygen, 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 this molecule uh, would not be polar it would not have polar bonds. Okay, So it's not polar because of its geometry and the molecule is not polar because of the bonds that are present. So some things that you can think about as we go through this. If we have one atom, say atom A, that's very very electronegative, like fluorine, it has an effect on the molecule overall. And notice in this case, the overall bond dipole and the partial charge gets associated with A and B. And C would also have more of a positive charge than, than A would as well, although the model doesn't show it. Now notice that this bond dipole essentially identifies the negatively charged region of the molecule. And also notice that this molecule is by default shown in a bent molecular geometry. So we can see that this region is charged a number of ways. And one way is to kind of put it in an electric field and see how it responds. If it really is charged, the negative side should be attracted to a positive side of an electric field. And we can turn that on over here. And we see that in this case the positive plate on this electric field attracts the negative end of the molecule. Now let's look at a different circumstance. And then I'd, I want to tell you exactly how to go about kind of investigating the prompts. Let's look at something that's linear. So if we take these atoms and try and make them all in a line. You notice that, <coughs> let's say we have carbon dioxide. This is a great example. So we would have carbon in the center, and A and C would both be oxygen. Now oxygen is actually more electronegative than carbon is. Uh, carbon's kind of in the middle ground in terms of what its electronegativity is. So I'm going to place both of these having the same setting because A and C would both be the same. In this case, notice that because of its geometry, the molecule overall 
has a dipole that cancels out. And we know that because you notice this black arrow at the left and the black arrow at the right are pulling in opposite directions, which means there's no overall molecule, molecular dipole. And you'll notice the molecular dipole box is checked, which means if there was a molecular dipole, we would see it as a yellow arrow. So these black arrows tell us that the bonds are polar, but because of the geometry, the molecule itself is nonpolar. There is no molecular dipole. And if we turn on an electric field, we notice that the molecule doesn't change. It doesn't change its position at all because there's no net molecular dipole. <clears throat> so your challenge is to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about if it's possible for a molecule to have covalent bonds, purely covalent bonds, and still be a polar molecule. And conversely, I want you to think about is it possible for a molecule to have polar bonds and be polar, or have polar bonds and be nonpolar. And to investigate this, what I would suggest that you do, click on the Real Molecules tab, and from the drop-down menu, you can try all kinds of different uh, atoms and molecule configurations. And don't forget that there's lots of options under the View panel for you to select. Don't forget to, to cite your evidence, which means if you really think you have a statement that you want to make, support it with a screenshot from this model so that everyone else in the class can read what you think. So go back and listen to this again if you need to. But other than that, have a good time tonight exploring, and let me know what you think in the discussions.